Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Ab Haas, and with me here today is none other than Team 8644, the Brainstormers from Massachusetts. They're the number one team in our FTC Stats Hall of Fame, and they are just so incredible. There's so much to learn about, so much to dive into. I can't wait to do it on Behind the Ball. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Annie Mark has parts and products designed specifically for First Robox competition and First Tech Challenge teams. Many Annie Mark staff are first alumni, mentors, and event volunteers. Visit AnnieMark.com for all your educational robotics needs. Kettering University has over 25 pre-college camps and learning experiences available from computer science and engineering to inspiring future women engineers, leadership development, and first base camps for first graders to graduating high school seniors. Magna and GM sponsored camp fee scholarships are available. Email ctaylor at kettering.edu for more information. John, let's begin just with the overall design of the robot. You know, you guys have been around for 10, 12 years. You know what it takes to build a good robot. You know how to win worlds, how to do well. So why did you settle on this design? Yeah, so the first thing we considered before we committed to a design was what our game strategy was gonna be because obviously that influences how we're gonna build the robot. So we made a game simulator right off the top of the season and we, um, we essentially made up a couple different strategies that we thought would be present at Worlds, and um, our results indicated to us that um, cycling on the high goals and also being able to go around the fields um, and you know go for ownership bonuses, mm -hmm. be able to like move around quickly was also very important. So we uh, committed to this design because it allows us to move around the field quickly while also being able to cycle. Yeah, so let's uh, dive into that a little bit more. You know, you said you made a simulator. So what did that look like? Was it just some sort of like Excel spreadsheet, something you made on your hands on a whiteboard or like a full CAD thing? Like, what was that? This was uh, a Java program, actually. Okay. I just taken CSA, so I knew all the stuff. Um, it was essentially like a 1v1 turn-based kind of simulation. Mm -hmm. We weren't thinking about, you know, speed of the robots at sure. that point. Just uh, we wanted to see like, one robot goes here, where do you mm -hmm. go? Mm -hmm. And then um, through that, we were able to, you know, tell what kind of generalization. Yeah, and you know, having competed in a couple different states and a lot of competitions this season, reflecting back on the design, are you happy with it or would you have switched to something else, you know, if you could do it all again? Yeah, so we're pretty happy with the design we have today. I think looking back in hindsight, we probably would have gone with something different, you know, maybe tune more of the speeds of the slides and stuff mm -hmm. just to get a little bit more reliability because we do have some issues with, you know, everything moving at once. Our robot can sometimes leave the floor. And so, you know, some other design changes probably, but we are still happy because we got what we asked for. Yeah, of course. And, you know, number one in the top 25 every single month since you guys have competed is definitely a sign of the reliability and high scoring potential that you guys have. So let's jump right into the design. Let's start with the drivetrain. Uh, we've seen a lot of different designs this season, you know, six wheel drive, Mechanum, Swerve, what have you. This robot is a little bit larger, I'd say, than typically other robots we see. So walk us through that. I'm sure it was a conscious decision to have, uh, you know, this style and everything. So walk us through the drivetrain and why you went with everything yeah so this is actually our ultimate goal drivetrain repurposed and so we have the four motors in here belted out with the mechanum it's an 18 by 18 inch you know there are three odometry modules the hub turret motor um, so the reason we went for this is we wanted a super low center of gravity especially with lifting a lot of weight up top uh, and then we also it recently added these anchors and so these will go into the mat They'll help our robot not turn in autonomous as we're cycling and also provide more friction so people can't push us as much. Yeah, and you know, you guys uh, decided to go for that six wheel drive last year, very different from the typical Brainstormers drivetrain. And so having gone through that, what lessons did you learn from that that you applied to this game? Yeah, so throughout the season, we thought we had the strongest drivetrain, but it turned out actually we didn't, f we found out that we didn't in the final matches where we were playing up a creek. And so they had a, just a similar Mechanum drivetrain and we found out we couldn't push them as much as you know other teams. And we really found out that it was a lot based on the shape of the bumpers of the team's robots. So they were getting a bit under us. And so all of our power wasn't going uh, as much as we expected. And we really didn't get a lot from the two extra motors in the drivetrain. So that's why we opted for McKinnon this year, especially since maneuverability is really important. Yeah, you know, definitely reflecting on past robots you've built and applying that knowledge to new games is super critical. So I want to talk a little bit about the software as far as your drivetrain goes. You know, you mentioned you have those odometry pods. So what are you using for your localization, path planning, following, all of that stuff? Tell us. Yeah, so our localization and 
navigation are all custom. We've been developing them for five years because, you know, we had odometry before Roadrunner or Peer Pursuit or any of those things were out. So we've been developing that year in, year out. Uh, and we use the odometry in Teleop to have lane assist technology. So basically, we set our position in uh, Teleop. And so from there, we keep our angle constantly as well as our position so that ideally we don't run into the sticks at all. And this really helps the drivers because they can go full blast and they don't have to worry about the robot veering to side. Sure. And, you know, just putting uh, some numbers out there, what ratio are you running for your motors? What motors are you running? Let's talk about that. Yeah, these are just classic Andy Mark 20 to 1, belted 1 to 1. Okay, yeah, thanks. So let's get into your guys' turret. You guys have a very, very large turret this season, definitely different from last year's robot. So walk us through the turret. Uh, specifically, let's start with how it was manufactured, what you're using for that big uh, round table, and go ahead. Sure, yeah. So the bearing is actually just a Lazy Susan that we have attached a 3D printed cog to. Um, so they're demonstrating now. It hasn't broken. It's four different pieces that are sort of jigsawed together. Mm -hmm. um, and it's running, it's a 162 tooth to 16th on the sprocket that's driving it. Wow, yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, you know, you guys will not run anything that hasn't been tested all the way, you know, as much as it possibly can. So is running like a 3D printed sprocket for powering a turret something you would recommend for other teams? Or would you suggest looking into different options? Well, we haven't broken ours yet, and we've run it the entire season. Mm -hmm. So this has been very reliable with us. Granted, that's partly because of the size of it, allows it to distribute the force over the entire size of it. Yeah, and you know, just looking at like the wear and tear on the teeth, have you seen any signs of fatigue or just damage on the teeth or not really a problem? We haven't seen any damaged teeth or broken or cracked teeth yet. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I think just having observed the robot, there's a lot of little things that also go into this turret, aligners here and there, just making sure the chain can't skip. So can we talk about some little additions you've made throughout the development of this robot that have really made sure it's as consistent as possible? Yeah, so with this turret, uh, especially is these idlers, and so if you look at them, they're actually on standoffs and they free flow up and down, and so that allows the chain wrap between this sprocket and this sprocket to constantly um, work and not skip, go up or down, and so this is something that we iterated over the course of the season, and I think we actually just got to this iteration, you know, a couple of days ago, and so, you know, yeah, We're no, that's fantastic. Constantly changing these little things here and there in our robot, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a redesign or little subsystem changes. Yeah, and as far as turret localization and tracking goes, we've seen a lot of different solutions in the community. How do you guys solve that issue? And you know, are there anything you would, are there any changes you would recommend to teams looking to do a similar thing? Yeah, so we actually have a touch sensor on the back of our robot, and so there's a piece on the drivetrain. So when we run autonomous, we make sure to line this up perfectly straight. Uh, and then from there, it's all just uh, encoder with the motor. And then, you know, in Teleop, we just reset it to zero and we assume that the autonomous basically finished back at this position. Yeah, and have you guys noticed any, uh, you know, drifting issues or loss of counts or anything like that? Has that been something you've had to deal with? No, it hasn't really been. Uh, the only issue could be like if autonomous leaves the turret at like the wrong position, uh, but usually that's 45 degrees. And then in Teleop, we can kind of turn it back to 45 degrees and reset that. So it's pretty recoverable. Yeah, and so my last question about uh, your turret has to do with the backlight. Have you faced any backlash issues? And if so, how did you solve them? Yeah, so initially we were using run to position with the motor, uh, their custom PID, and we found that it was getting to position pretty quickly, but there was a lot of backlash. And so that's why we actually went to our own custom control, custom PID. So we calculate the, uh, you know, the speed based off uh, the position as well as the projected position of the turret. Mm -hmm. It's kind of similar to our navigation in autonomous. And so this has really helped us so that we can get the turret fast and then also stop on a dime. Yeah, no, of course, you know, adapting parts from other subsystems is really, really useful in making sure new subsystems work. So now going on to your lift, uh, let's talk about it. Just give an overview of it first, what you're using to run it, and then we'll jump into some of the finer details like the uh, springs. Yeah, so initially this for the start of the season, we tried a double reverse four bar because as many people saw uh, in Skystone, gluten-free got it pretty quick uh, and pretty stable. So we got it very fast, but it was pretty wobbly at the top. So then we just started uh, prototyping a door side lift with counterforce springs. And so these will constantly pull the lift up to counteract the giant assembly that we're lifting up. And so this allows us to lift in about half a second. Uh, when we had no load on it, it was about 0.1 seconds. If you take the middle assembly out, this thing could poke off your eye. So you gotta be a bit careful with these. 
Uh, and then for motors, we're running two motors chained together. They're both 3.7 ratio. Uh, and we basically go full beans up. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. And so, you know, you mentioned that huge assembly. It's pretty much a whole nother robot on top of your drivetrain turret and lift. So let's start with just what actuators you have on it, what degrees of freedom, how many, and then we'll jump into the details. Yeah, so the main part of our robot is this horizontal extension. And so this will extend the length of the robot and then extend out. And the way we accomplish this is this locking mechanism. So because of this, the MGN slides will run first and then the slider comes and disengages the lock and then allows it to extend. And when it comes back, it re-engages it. Yeah, so I had the opportunity of seeing that in Chesapeake and it was just one of the most clever ways of solving the issue of using linear rail in order to make sure you're in the right position every time. Yeah, and so it's a five to one motor powered, belted, uh, I think one to one. And so we run this pretty quick out uh, and then retraction is a bit complicated because you, you want to make sure that you engage the lock every time, but you also don't want to you know, burn out the motor. So we've played around a lot with that over the course of the season. Mm -hmm. uh, and then our use of state machines allows us to you know, set different speeds based off of where we're coming from, uh, from either all the way out or just half out. Yeah, of course. And so now let's get on to your claw arm, the whole end effector. So how many degrees of freedom do you have on it? And then what are you running for the various actuators? Sure, yeah. So we have about seven degrees of freedom um, when it comes from the base all the way up. But just on the arm, so we have this first sort of elbow mechanism here, which are two axon servos that drive a this first piece. Mm -hmm. um, we're using a spring here to help counterbalance it, the weight, to which then we have this differential which allows us to go up, down, as well as rotate. What this gives us the ability to do is pick up fallen cones and cones at weird angles. Yeah, and so I think your end effector is something that's seen the most changes throughout the year, You know, whether it be through just necessity or new game rulings coming out, what have you. But let's talk a little bit, let's start with the elbow, as you call it, talk about how that's changed throughout the season, and then we'll jump into the different parts. So what iterations have you gone through there and what did you learn from each one? Sure, yeah, so at our Chesapeake, we actually had to replace both these servos because they broke when they were not axons, but they were also being directly driven. Mm -hmm. And we found out that the forces being put into them would actually burn out the servos, mm -hmm. which led to very quick and hastily repairs. So we changed, we turned to this chaining mechanism, which helps alleviate the force from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and are you guys running like any tensioners or have you had the need to do any of that or is it just straight chain center to center, no issues? It's just straight chain center to center. Okay, cool. And now going on to your end effector, Definitely the whole chain differential is the most significant upgrade since Chesapeake, since Massachusetts. So talk us through that, uh, you know, especially how you're able to program that. You know, are you doing any inverse kinematics to track the position of the claw or is it just set positions you're constantly going to? Yeah, so in terms of programming, it's just set positions. And so we basically have, you know, a standard intake position, uh, falling this way, falling this way, falling this way. And then this all will twist up uh, when we go to score. And you know, we when we designed it, we knew that you know the it would work the system. And then obviously, when we had to plug in the servers and test it, we weren't sure exactly how it would go. Uh, but it turned out to be a lot easier than we expect. You just have to set the servo to the position and the claw, and the differential will kind of do the work to get to the position we want. Yeah, fantastic. And the thing that stood out to me most about you guys when I saw your first RoboStorm 7.1 qualifier, whatever it was, was how you were just able to slam the claw into the wall, pick up the cone, and leave. So talk us uh, talk us through that. You know, did you do anything special in the design when you did that, and have you? Had had any other versions of the claws that you just aren't running today? So this claw is actually pretty similar to the initial claw that we had. It's silicone with foam inside. And so through this, we can always get as much uh, surface area contacting the cone as possible because the foam will adjust to the different radius of the cone, no matter where it is. And in terms of slamming in, we just go full beans out, uh, slow down near the end, and then uh, we used to have a sensor to detect the cone and automatically intake, but it turns out we don't really need it as much as before, um, especially with the differential. We turned out the wiring was a bit weird and trying yeah. to fit it in was difficult. Sure. And so I think the last thing I want to talk about is the sensor use on the overall end effector. I see you guys have an array of uh, digital distance sensors and analog distance sensors, uh, one of the two over here. So walk us through how that works and how it's changed throughout the season if you've had to make any changes. So these are three analog sharp distance sensors. And so 
we use them basically for true false and so we detect the stick initially before you guys were allowed we just had a flat bar and we were scanning over it with these sensors and so we were a bit sad to find out that the you guys were allowed um, but we still kept them because when we go up to score an autonomous if these see the stick then we know we can score if they don't we can retract and try again so that's some smarts that we've added in since chesapeake yeah and you know brainstormers i guess my last question to you guys overall having competed for so many years i'm sure there have just been hundreds of lessons you've learned what is the single most important piece of advice you have for ftc teams who are trying to set you know make the mark that you guys left on ftc make your goals have fun try to reach them you know, meet people along the way, learn from them, uh, check out our YouTube channel, check out other teams' YouTube channels, really. If you, if you want to put in work, uh, you got to, you know, get the research and then do the work. It's not going to build itself. Uh, and have fun, eat pizza, and build an epic robot. Yeah. All right. Well, for the last time ever, this is Team 8644 Brainstormers in the Power Play season. Just absolutely amazing team, amazing robot. So much to learn from. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm a boss. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Kettering University has over 25 pre-college camps and learning experiences available from computer science and engineering to inspiring future women engineers, leadership development, and first base camps for first graders to graduating high school seniors. Magna and GM sponsor camp fee scholarships are available. Email ctaylor at kettering.edu for more information. Animark is your one-stop shop for all your educational robotics needs. From mechanical, electrical, tools, and hardware, Animark has over 200 years of first-team experience and offers high-quality and affordable solutions for the robotics mobility and competition markets. Head on over to Animark.com to get started. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.